What's up guys, Lifting here. Welcome to the first episode of the Path of Exile Survival Guide, a walkthrough from start to finish uh, in Path of Exile. I'm hoping to teach you new players out there what it uh, means to progress and level a character in uh, Path of Exile. We'll go over, well basically I'll try to share everything I know about how you go about creating your character, uh, using the skill tree, uh, linking your gems correctly, trading, gearing up, all that stuff. And we're going to do it in a walkthrough type of manner. So I'm going to start a character at level one and we'll go the intent is to take it into uh, uh, late game maps. And there's a lot of info for me to share here. So um, yeah, I'm looking forward to get st getting started with this. I did this a couple of years ago and uh, the game has simply just changed so much. Now we're doing it again. And the first thing we're going to do is to create a character. We click create. Uh, oh, well, actually, the first thing we're going to do is to select a league for that character. And what that means is that there are different ladder systems in Path of Exile. There are the permanent ladders, and then there are temporary um, challenge period ladders, <laughs> for lack of a better word. <laughs> Basically, uh, what I'm talking about here is challenge leaks and challenge leaks are leaks that run on a temporary basis. So typically they will be running for three months and uh, that means that everyone will know a specific start time for when these go live and um, they will know when the leak ends. So you will have three months typically to compete in one of the challenge leaks, either the soft core version or the hard core version. Um, the nice thing about this is that by joining a new challenge league, you will be playing against players who have started at the same time as you, or at least in, um, like, as opposed to if you play on standard, you could be playing against people or with people who have been playing the game for several years. And obviously, if you've been playing in the permanent standard or hardcore version of that, they will have lots and lots of items, lots of currency, all these things, right? Um, and it's just a great feel to start over, try uh, try building a new character, or of course you can do that in the other one too, but there's something, there's something to that fresh feel of it. It's by far one of my favorite things in Path of Exile, and I highly, highly recommend if you are a new player, then uh, you should always start with the challenge leaks. Um, it's just going to give you a better experience into the game. Also because the standard leaks and the hardcore uh, permanent leak, they have such an established um, economy already and it's a little harder to get your foot in the door because the, well, that's a different discussion, but let's, let's just put it like this. It's a good idea to always start in one of the challenge leaks. The difference between hardcore and uh, non-hardcore is that um, when a character dies in hardcore, it will be moved to standard. Even if you play in the hardcore betrayal, right? It will not be moved to betrayal, softcore, it will be moved to standard. So what this means is, is that if you uh, were playing with your friends, you all started the character in hardcore betrayal and one of you dies, then since that character is now over in standard, you will no longer be able to play with uh, the rest of the team because he's on a different ladder system now. He's in a different world, guys. He's in a better place. Um, and that's like the main difference here. Typically with the challenge leaks, there's also going to be new mechanics. Those are the mechanics that GGG has been working on and they are being presented to us in the new challenge leaks. So there's also that extra amount of fun. Um, at least if you were, again, if you play the game a lot, it's very refreshing to be able to uh, try some new mechanics and such. There's also the solo self found uh, thing you can enable here. What this means is that you won't be able to, uh, if you create this, you won't be able to trade with other people and you won't be able to party with other people. Some people like that just because they like going about doing their own thing. And uh, some people like it because it extends the duration of how long it takes to gear up and get your character complete because you can't trade for items. 
And some people just look at it as like this extra challenge they apply to themselves. It's really up to you what you want to do here, but I do recommend the challenge leagues at least. And I think I'd also advise you to not play solo self out the first time around. But it's up to you, of course. Hardcore, go ahead. If, even if you're new, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but you should expect to die. Uh, but it's one of the best ways of learning the game. We're going to do it in Betrayal, Softcore League. I have another character over there. Um, we're going to do that because I don't want to risk my character dying throughout the uh, video recording here. And also because uh, I'm going to play hardcore myself later in the league. So we're going Betrayal, non-solo self found because I want to show you guys how you trade. And that's the more exciting part of it. We have to choose a class. And um, it can be a little confusing which class to choose because if you click a class in Path of Exile, it's not really giving you much information. It's just kind of giving you some lore, story type of thing, which doesn't really matter anyway. Um, so let me tell you real quick what the difference is between the classes. The main difference between these are their starting position in the skill tree. In Path of Exile, we all uh, share the same skill tree. And what you need to take note of here is that these circles here, these are all representing a starting position for one of the classes in the game. This here is the Marauder. This one here is the Templar. Up here we have the Witch, the Shadow, the Ranger, the Duelist, and then finally the Scion here in the middle. Now, I'm a little unsure if you are completely new to the game. If you actually have the Scion class unlocked, uh, it used to be so that you would unlock her in Act 3 at some point. I'm not going to spoil it for you if you don't know. Um, but um, could you please let me know in the comments if you actually have the sign available because I don't know if that's part of the game anymore if you have to actually unlock her. Either way, their starting position, the only thing that really determines is which skill nodes they are going to have available from the get-go and which ones that are going to be close to them. So for instance, let's say we wanted to make a bow build. I'm going to type bow here in Path of Building so it highlights the bow nodes. We can see that the ranger over here or near the ranger, there's quite a lot of bone nodes. What this means is that we would have to travel less of a distance than if we were playing as a marauder and we wanted to get bone nodes. It also means that they will be available to us sooner. So if we want to level with bows, we're going to have a better scaling uh, into bows at a sooner or at a, yeah, sooner. <laughs> Um, but the other thing that's super important for when you choose your class is which ascendancy um, classes or specializations they have available. So up here by the Templar, for instance, uh, we have the Guardian, we have the Hierophant, and we have the no, I've Inquisitor, <laughs> Hierophant, and the Guardian available. Each class in the game have three ascendancy specializations available. And at some point in the game, typically around level 35 to 40, you can get to unlock your Ascendancy class. And these Ascendancy classes have some insanely powerful uh, bonuses that you can spec into that will make your character stronger. So you have to kind of go over each Ascendancy and think to yourself, hmm, what would be great for the type of build that I'm going to play? So the thing that's a little backwards in Path of Exile, I guess, is that you think before you choose a class, you actually thinking more about what type of build you're going to play. Um, typically, someone would, in other games, you'd start a class and then you'd figure out your build. You kind of, if you want to prepare properly, you should think about the type of build you want to play first. Now, I know that I will want, I want to play a Templar in uh, the survival guide here. And that's because I want to play with Arc Totems. I think that's an amazing uh, beginner guide. And this gives me the opportunity to level it so you guys can see how to do that. And I can share the build with you guys too. And uh, I uh, also know that to uh, use totems or a an ascendancy that's amazing for totems would be the Hierophant, which is this guy here. And he's great because of a few things. Uh, he's great because of Pursuit of Faith, for instance, which gives us uh, totem duration. It gives us plus maximum number of summoned totems. That's the main thing. And then we get uh, increased uh, damage per enemy killed and increased attack speed. Uh, and cast speed while we have a totem up. So a very nice bonus. And uh, we have eight ascendancy points available. Let's say try and click the Templar here and then we would go Hierophant. You can see up here, DC represents how many ascendancy points we have available. So I would choose Pursuit of Faith. 
And then I would also want to go Ritual of uh, Awakening for more totem placement speed. We'll get more damage per totem. Uh, and we'll get some regen and such. Then I'd also want to get Conviction of Power, so I get uh, Penetration. Also for easy access to generating charges and such. This will be a non-crit uh, Arc Totem build though. But still, there's some something to be gained from this. I am considering maybe going for Illuminate Devotion up here. But we'll figure it out as we go. To start with, this is the way I'll be spending my ascendancy points. This makes sense for me. This will make my give me a lot more mana, which will make mind over meta strong, which is a defense that we can pick up over here in the skill tree that makes it so that 30% of damage is taken from our mana pool instead of our health pool um, at first. So because I'm going to play as the Templar, we're going to select that now in game. And all of this here, guys, all the more complicated aspects of selecting a character. I have made a video about this recently. I'm going to link that below. It goes much more in detail about it, but for now, let's just create the character and we can also talk more about this as we go through uh, out the walkthrough. So let's head back into the game. We will select the Templar and we're going to name him Lifting God. Survival Bro. And we're going to press OK. And we're in the League Betrayal. That's what we wanted to do. We're in the soft core, uh, permanent or not permanent uh, challenge league. And let's get into the game. And we now find ourselves at the Twilight Strain, uh, stranded after having been exiled by Dominus. And we're going to try and get our revenge. We're going to go all the way through and we're going to show him who's the real, real boss. So uh, anytime you start out in Path of Exile, you'll have some tutorials available to you. This is a good idea if you're new to uh, follow these, of course. It's a good way to learn the game, but they are not very comprehensive, uh, to be honest. I'm going to skip them because I am going to be the tutorial <laughs> via this here. So there will always be a weapon uh, relevant to your class as you start out in Path of Exile. If you play as the uh, Templar, it's a Driftwood Scepter. If it's the Witch, it will be a Wand, etc. But the important thing to take note of is that when you pick up the weapon, typically it will auto-equip it, uh, unless you have that setting off. But um, you need to take a good look at the colors of the sockets here. And this becomes relevant after we talk to this guy here. Because a gem drops, a skill gem. A skill gem is, in Path of Exile, the way you gain abilities. Basically, these small gems here are divided into two categories. There are active skill gems, like this one here, which means that they grant an ability by themselves. And then there's support gems. Support gems are gems that support active skill gems. Basically, they make uh, the active skill gems stronger. So, and let me show you how this works. Right now, you can see down here, this is all we have available, where our abilities and skills should be available right we have default attack and we have move only we're going to put in the glacial hammer now and as you can see it shows up down here as an ability that we can now use and what glacial hammer does is that uh, with attacks it hits the enemy converting some of our physical damage into cold damage if the enemy is frozen and is on less than one third of a life they will shatter basically meaning they will get destroyed uh, and that shadow effect can be applied to other stuff too, but that's, that's a little more complicated. We'll talk about that later. Um, and we can see that it requires a mace or a staff. Fortunately, uh, the scepter here is considered a one-handed mace. So we can use this skill. Now, if you were to start as the duelist, um, then not only would you have a different weapon available from the get-go, but you would also have a different skill gem available from the get-go. I can't remember what it is, but I think it may be cleave or double strike or something like that. All right, we got the gem uh, put into our set, so we can now use it. If we were to take it out, the, the skill disappears, right? An the important thing there is to know in Path of Exile is that, let's say we had a, a shield or, or helmet or armor, whatever, right? And it had sockets too. You could put the Glacial Hammer into that too. Just because it's an attack ability does not mean that it necessarily have to be in your weapon. Um, it could just as well have been in your armor. 
And the same goes for if you get a def defensive ability, it doesn't have to be in your armor. So we, we have the Glacial Hammer here, and we can see there's a blue socket in this Scepter too. That means that if we find a gem that is blue, with basically that means that it has an intelligence attribute um, alignment, I guess you could say. But if we find that, we can put that in the blue socket here. And preferably it should be a support gem so we can increase the power of Glacial Hammer. But let's um, head out on towards the city now. Now actually one thing I will do before we do that, I will recommend you to when you start out in Path of Exile, to um, not use your right mouse button to for your primary attack. And I recommend that for the uh, reason that it's going to most likely be healthier for you long term. For me personally, I started to develop uh, forearm issues um, when I was having it on my right click. And that's because you put a lot of strain on your uh, on your forearm by holding down the right mouse button so much. And I know that sounds incredibly pathetic. <laughs> that, that something as, as, as little as that can, can have that effect. But uh, you're doing yourself a favor uh, by changing that. And that's why my middle mouse button, I don't like using that normally. I change that to space. And then I always put my main attack on space uh, and use that as my attack. It feels pretty natural once you get used to it. And then I remove this. I typically reserve this for my movement ability. Another thing that's a very good idea is to change your default attack button here to move only. And that's because, let's say you're fighting a, a horde of monsters over here and uh, you want to run up here, but there's a lot of monsters. If you then use your regular, like, the thing is, you, the movement, right, it's shared by the default attack. If there's something to attack, it will use the attack. But if there's nothing to attack, it will, uh, it will just move if you have default attack enabled. But if you want to run up here and there's a lot of monsters, if the default attack is enabled and you're trying to click here to run up, then it will start to try and attack it. If it's a melee ability, it's not too bad because it will still run up there and attack, but it will slow you down. It will start the animation, right? If it's a ranged ability, it's a little worse because you'll just be standing still and you'll be trying to either shoot up there with a bow or a spell or something like that. And this can be very dangerous if you're playing hardcore uh, because you're not running away from what it is that you're trying to run away from or towards. So I highly recommend that you set your default attack to move only. Also because you're not really going to use your default attack anyway, unless for very, very specific reasons. I, but I recommend that you can always put your default attack on one of the other buttons if, if, if it's really an issue. Uh, for instance, if we use Glacial Hammer, we can see it has a 5 mana cost. But if we spend all the mana on that, it will start using auto attack either way. So it's no big deal and I, I'd recommend that. Um, but it's up to you, of course. So let's run towards the uh, city now. And uh, we're passing through lots of uh, enemies here on the beach. And most of them are cadavers, as we can see. Let's try and use our uh, regular attack. Actually, I'm going to use the default attack here now just to show you the difference between the skills. So this here would be our regular uh, default attack, right? All right. Uh, as opposed to when we use Glacial Hammer. And that you could see there in the end, that was the shatter because it was below a certain health point. So when we look at the DPS difference, we can see that default attack is 8.9 and uh, Glacial Hammer is 13.7. Uh, so obviously a little better, right? One thing I will uh, recommend is also though that you can use the DPS tooltip as a if you really know how everything is scaled, probably you can use it as a way of gauging progress. But in general, I would really not recommend using the DPS tooltip in game to figure out how much damage you deal, because there's a major, major difference between the skills and not everything is calculated correctly in game. It's much better to use path of building for that and import your character into that to get a more accurate uh, view of well, how much damage you deal. It's kind of like if you are <laughs> If you are uh, measuring your weight loss progress by stepping on a scale, uh, that's not a very good idea either because it doesn't really show if you've been gaining muscle at the same time, right? Either way, 
For any character as we progress throughout the Twilight Strain, we will encounter this large chest at some point, and it's very mysterious. It's glowing. Hmm, what could be in here? Anytime you click this, there will be a support gem in there. And again, this support gem is going to be different uh, depending on which class you're playing. We're getting Elemental Proliferation here, which I think is a terrible choice for them to have put there. Elemental Proliferation is pretty bad for, for what we're using here, but fair enough. We'll put it in. What it does is that it gives us 20% chance to freeze, shock, and ignite. And uh, then it gives... Uh, the whole thing about Proliferation is that when you apply either freeze, shock, or ignite... Then there is um, then elemental proliferation makes it so that this can proliferate. This effect ailment can proliferate onto other monsters. So let's say you were using a burn skill that were causing the ignite. Uh, that ignite, that burn effect, could then spread to other monsters and burn them to death. Whereas with the glacial hammer, it can make the freeze uh, go onto other enemies, and you can hit multiple targets with that ailment. But it's We'll, we'll put it on, but it's not really that useful for us right here. So we'll use it here. Another thing that's also there is to know about the support gems is that support gems do typically increase the mana cost of your skills. So you don't want to just throw a support gem in there if it's not really that useful. Also, not all support gems work for any active skill gem. But we'll talk a little more about that as we get further in. And we are now encountering the first boss of the game Kellogg he's a big ass zombie guy and uh, we're gonna start attacking him and one thing you'll notice here if you take a look at my life that is the main thing you need to learn here and by mana over at the other side you need to be efficient with your flasks and use them preemptively in many cases to prevent yourself from running out of mana in the beginning so if you want to make sure you are as effectively attacking constantly without any downtime where you use a default attack, you need to make sure your mana is up uh, to do that. Uh, for life, that's of course more of a retroactive type of thing where you react to the damage you've been taking. But uh, in some cases, you, if you are at low health, you kind of need to be proactive with it and make sure you heal up before that happens but it's very basic you know that of course the point is uh, that i'm trying to make here is that flasks in path of exile are different from uh, flasks you would typically see in other games so let's say you were playing diablo 3 the flask you use in diablo 3 they have a certain amount of quantity or at least they used to i don't know if they still have uh, and when you use it you heal up for a certain amount in path of exile your flasks have charges and we can see um, this flask here, it recovers 70 life over 6 seconds. And it consumes 7 out of 21 charges on use. So what does that mean? It means that... Let's try and take some damage here. I'm going to use my small life flask here now. You can see it. we lose a bit of, of juice, right? And we can see it currently has 14 charges. If we use it again, it has 7 charges. So it means that in a, for a full flask, in this case for the small life flask, we can use that 3 times before it's empty. So what do we do once it's empty? Well, we could use the other flask, of course. But what would we do when that is empty? In Path of Exile, it works so that when you kill enemies... Let's see if we can show it here. We need to kill more. But when we kill enemies... Our flasks refill. And it would be great if there were some more zombies here. So I could demonstrate this. Maybe this guy up here. And not this time either. And... I guess it's seven we need to kill to get the seven uh, charges. Um, and we can see we also lost a mana charge here. Because I've spent that to regen my mana. So, let's kill this. Yes, there we, we got seven monsters killed here. That has granted us seven charges. That means we can now use the flask again. So, you are in some sense being rewarded for being or playing offensively, if you know what I mean. Uh, in regards to flasks, at least. Because if you are in a big fight 
and you're starting to run out of flasks, the best way to get those flasks back is to focus on killing your enemy so you can get the charges back. And now what I demonstrated to you here was pretty slow, of course, uh, because there's only a few monsters. But when you get further into endgame, there's like hundreds of monsters surrounding you sometimes. So your flask can refill pretty quickly. Uh, but as you get further into the game, they will also have a higher charge uh, requirement and so forth. We'll talk more about flask later too. So after we killed Hillock, uh, we can see this is the stuff that he dropped. And... Uh, we do um, for the sake of it we're just going to pick up everything right now and then uh, i'm going to show you here we automatically equip the leather cap and uh, because this scepter here gives us increased elemental damage we're going to equip it in our our other socket too so now we have two scepters each of them granting us elemental damage for a total of 20 percent increased elemental damage and we can see by the tooltip here it's 27.3 if we were to take it out, it should decrease a little, right? And uh, one thing there is to know here is that as soon as you dual wield anything, your character gets a 15% increased attack speed. As opposed to if you were having a one-hander and a shield. Anytime you're dual wielding two weapons, then you will get a 15% increased attack speed bonus. So it's not only the increased elemental damage, that also increases the damage of Glacial Hammer here, but it's also because we're dual wielding and we get the 15% increased attack speed bonus. Uh, we could also have chosen this uh, Driftwood Scepter here because it has the sockets we would need either way and it also has a green one. So let's do that. We're going to take our gems and we're, then we're going to put it into this and then we're going to have an extra socket in case we need to use that for anything. We don't want to use bows. We're not going to level that way. Uh, the Rusted Spike here it could have been an option, but since uh, I want to level with Freezing Pulse, we're not going to need a weapon. We're going to need something that just scales our spell and elemental damage. So we, we don't really care too much about the melee damage of uh, any weapon yet. Uh, it'll make a little more uh, sense as I show you that. So we're still going to pick this up because we're just going to sell it for a big of, bit of uh, Wisdom uh, Scroll Fragments. Let's head into Lion's Watch. The first city of the game and we'll just head right through into this so what i would typically advise for you to do is the first thing as you get into the town is of course to talk to the npcs and if you care about the lore listen to what they have to say but otherwise just Stay you know go uh, to tarclay and get your quest reward from killing hillock we can see that like if you press U on your keyboard, these are the quests that you have available. Now, um, this one here says that it's completed for me and that's because I have another character in the league, so ignore that. But this one here, enemy at the gate. You have killed Helak, the zombie attacking the town. Talk to Tarkley for a reward. And that is this guy here. Now, if you don't pick the reward the first time uh, and it closes down the option, you can always talk to him again and then you click Helak reward. And what Tarkley offers us here is some is an alternative to the active skill gem we're using right now. And he, uh, we can get Smite, we can choose Frostbolt, Magma Orb, Lightning Tendrils, or Molten Strike. And if we were just to choose between these, I would prefer leveling with um, Frostbolt. But I do prefer leveling with Freeze Pulse. So how do we get that skill gem? Well, first of all, you can't get any skill gem from the get-go. Uh, as I said, different classes have different skill gems. You could create a, a witch and do the exact same quest here, and you would probably you would probably be able to choose that quest or that skill gem, Freezing Pulse, as a quest reward from Tarkley then. Alternatively, though, because it is a level 1 skill gem, we can talk to Nessa over here, and she just gives us a different quest to talk to Bestel, but let's do that after. Um... When you talk to Nessa, first of all, she and you ask her to buy stuff. First of all, there's stuff available, of course, that you, you can purchase. And typically, these are very cheap in the beginning because they are pretty bad items too. But some of them can actually be of a big help. Either way, on page two, you can find the skill gems that are available to your character that you've unlocked so far in this act. And we can see Heavy Strike is available. That's an attack skill. We, we don't want to use that. Glacial Hammer is the one we have. 
Uh, there's Molten Strike, that's another attack skill. There's Ground Slam and attack skill. And as you can see, these are red. These are strength aligned. Uh, typically, they have a higher strength um, requirement to be able to use. Uh, and then we have something like Spectral Throw here, which is green, which is Dexterity aligned. But then we have all of these blue items here, which are Intelligence aligned. And I'm pretty sure there is a Freezing Pulse here. Yes, we can see it costs one Scroll of Wisdom, so we're going to pick that up. Now, there are no support gems available uh, yet, except for the elemental proliferation that we unlocked earlier. We don't really care about that because it's not really optimal for us to level with. But we're going to close this down again, and then we're going to equip our Freezing Pulse in our uh, Scepter over here. Or you could alternatively keep in the Glacial Cascade or Glacial, um, glacial Hammer for now and put the Freezing Pulse. That was the frost bolt. Over in the other socket over here, or in the helmet. Doesn't matter, it just has to be a blue um, socket. What we do want though is we preferably want to have a weapon or uh, any other piece of equipment that has linked sockets so that when we get another support gem at some point, then we can link our freezing pulse to that. And if we talk to Nessa, we can see that she has... This one here could probably be useful. Um, because I know that the next support gem I want to get for my character is going to be Onslaught. And Onslaught is a support gem that increases our attack, cast and movement speed when we kill stuff. It's a green gem. And uh, to be able to link that, we're going to need a blue gem for our Freezing Pulse. And we're going to need a green gem for Onslaught. And it also, if we look at this one here, it's a magic wand, which is indicated by the blue text. Um, and it gives spell damage, it gives cast speed and mana. So, hmm, let's, let's just take that for now. The thing is, though, you can't dual wield a scepter and a wand. You can dual, dual wield some things together, and typically it would be uh, melee weapons together, or it would be... Uh, Something like double wands or something like that. So let's just get ourselves another wand too. And which one has the best sockets for this? Um, we will just go with the one that has three sockets because it should be the most versatile. So we're going to take out our scepters. And then we're going to put our wands on here and we're going to take our uh, freezing pulse. And for now, we don't have any support for it, but we're going to take the other wand and put that up here. So we're still going to benefit from the attack speed, right? Because we're still dual wielding. It doesn't matter if it's a melee or if it's a ranged weapon. We're still going to benefit from that inherent bonus from dual wielding. Uh, and each of these wands also have increases to spell damage, so that's going to increase the damage of our freezing pulse. So since we have freezing pulse here, we can see that when it's equipped, it shows up down here. Again, as normal, I would put it on my space. But again, it's up to you. We can see Freezing Pulse. It has 17.6 DPS when we look at the tooltip right now. And a 4 mana cost and a cast time of 0.61. This means that for the animation to start and for it to end, it will take uh, that amount of time. And the lower this is, the more smooth it's going to feel. And that would be something like cast speed that could influence that. The way a uh, freezing pulse works is that it shoots a projectile in front of us and uh, deals cold damage to monsters. Uh, the closer they are to the projectile, the more damage it deals or, and it pierces enemies, which basically means that the projectile isn't consumed. Uh, it will deal damage to enemies behind it too that it pierces. So let's sell some of the stuff we don't really need here. We don't need the weapon, we don't need the scepters. Actually, one thing would be good. We're going to keep the scepters here. I don't need three, though. So we're going to get rid of the stuff here we don't want. And this is going to give us some... Instead of gold in Path of Exile, you basically get currency back. And there's lots of different types of currency, but we can talk a lot about that later. For now, just know that you get currency back instead of gold. There's nothing wrong with this. Alteration shot will turn into, once you have 20 of these, into an alteration orb. And uh, once you have... Uh, five scroll fragments, it will turn into a wisdom scroll, uh, which is what you use to identify items. So we're going to accept this, and we're just going to keep it as it is here. 
Um, but for the two weapons I was talking about here, a good idea in Path of Exile is to uh, effectively level the skill gems that you think you may want to use later in the game or to pick some skill gems that has some potential value to be sold to other players. As an example, I will show you, we're going to do weapon swap here. And in our weapon swap, we're going to put in our scepters. And uh, I'm going to put in my frost bolt. Now, even when I swap back to my main uh, weapon setup and can use freezing pulse, even when I then kill monsters, my skill gems are going to gain experience and be able to level up. So if you have a lot of skill gems you want to level up and get stronger, but you don't want to or don't have room for them to be in your main setup, it's a good idea to get a weapon swap setup and put them in there uh, for them to be placed so they can still gain experience because your skill gems will not gain any experience by being in your inventory. Uh, they need to be equipped, but it's okay for them to be equipped on the weapon swap. The two other skill gems we have available, we're just going to get rid of them. I don't really care about using it with... Uh, Freezing poles. We could do that, but I don't really care about it. So we're just going to sell that uh, to... It's going to give us the two uh, fragments here. And we can see that turning into a wisdom scroll then. Farewell. Another thing that happened uh, before we got into town, as we killed Hillock, was that we leveled up. We got our first skill point. We're going to click that, or you can press P on your keyboard to uh, go there directly. Um... So as you can see, as I told you earlier, we start in this position because we're the Templar. Had we been the Witch, we would have been starting up here. So what do we want to pick now? What would make sense? I know I want to use Arc Totems later on. And Arc Totems, um, first of all, it deals lightning damage. Arc is a lightning spell. And Totems in themselves can be scaled to, for instance, if we were to pick up the node down here, Primal Manifestation, it would give increased totem damage. The increased totem damage would also apply to Arc because it's being used as a totem. For us to use it as a totem, we need to get the support gem uh, called Spell Totems, though. We don't have that yet, but we'll get there. So what have, do we have available? We have mana, region, and life available, and we have damage and mana available. So now that we'll be leveling with Freezing Pulse, which is a cold skill until we get Arc, Let's go with damage and mana because, well, that's just generically going to scale freezing pulse. If you want, you can hold down control when you click, then you don't need to press the apply points afterwards. But for the sake of it, I'm just clicking right here and then apply points. And we can see for it to scale. Actually, it's we can press C on your keyboard to this opens your character uh, tab. And then you can select freezing pulse here. We can see the DPS here. And then we reply up apply point you can see this increasing because it's now taking the skill node here using that to scale the damage of freezing pulse all right that means next time we can for instance pick this and then the next time again we'll have to choose which frames we'll go uh, into from here and uh, these gives elemental damage these give attack and minion damage and since we are using a spell elemental spell it would make sense to get elemental damage right this would help us scale the damage of that too. Also because attack and minion damage, we're, we're not really, we're not using minions here. And uh, we're not attacking, we're casting. That's a big difference between the two archetypes in the game. There's bow uh, archetypes, there's caster types, there are uh, attack types, right? But it's a little more complicated. We'll, we'll talk more about it too. Either way, we selected our first point, we're level 2, we're doing great. But before we end uh, the uh, first episode of the survival guide today, I want to go into the UI settings and show you some of that too. Because there's a few things that I recommend that you enable there to get the best uh, experience with the game. But let's just quickly talk to Bestel, because Bestel is going to give us a quest that uh, asks us to go to the... Uh, Tidal Island, which is a zone off or off the coast to uh, the beach. Tidal, yeah, the coast. That's the next place. Either way, that means that when you press U on your keyboard, you can select this quest and it will show you where you need to go. This here, this yellow line is an indicator of the area you have to go through. And each circle here represents a zone 
So when you go into the coast, that would be the next zone you can go into. It would be this here. But it means that you would have to go into two zones to reach this place. And this here is the tidal island. You would not be able to find the mercy mission quest item in this zone here. It has to be in the next zone. Uh, so two zones ahead. These over here, ignore them for now. We'll talk about that later too. Um, but let me head out to the coast before uh, we end and show you some of the UI settings that I recommend. Um, we're going to go to options. And then we're going to go into UI. And here's a few different settings that can be very useful to enable. And some of them are completely personal preference. And you should go with what you like. So first of all, uh, language and checked language. That's irrelevant to us unless you have a specific uh, desire there. Uh, June, we have no time to talk to you right now. Then there's screen shake and personally i kind of like screen shake <laughs> i find it to be um it kind of makes your character feel stronger because it makes everything shake but for some people it actually reduces their uh, performance in game uh, fps i mean and not their ability to perform so in general it's probably best to just have screen shake disabled for the best experience but you can try that on and off to see what you like then there's the quest tracker i never have this on anymore because i know the quests by heart right but if you're a new player this can be a good idea to kind of um, keep you focused on the goal at hand i want to turn it off then there's the corner map and i don't know a lot of people who don't play with this but i personally don't and that's because um, this mini map that you see up here when you press tab on your keyboard you open the map right this is um, basically the overlay you can see that as we discover here and i prefer that much more than i prefer looking up in the corner sometimes some people like having both because when you disable the map here then it will show up there but i just find it unnecessary so i'm playing without that auto center map can be very good um, because when you press tab again to open the map which if you use your key uh, your up and down keys on your keyboard you can move the map around right when you then press tab again it will auto center the map if you don't have this on and you move it around when you then press it again it will be in the same position um, then there's something like landscape transparency and map transparency. This uh, influences how your map is going to look like. So if we turn landscape transparency all the way up, it draws the landscape on your map. And I can see the appeal in that, but in all honesty, it's completely useless um, because you're going, you're seeing the landscape either way. You don't need it to be drawn there and it's just taking up more space and uh, gives you more stuff to get distracted by so i personally turn that all the way down i don't need it or well i actually leave it at one point up but i'll explain that later uh, it's because of certain things in the labyrinth then there's something like map transparency if you want the opacity of the map to be lower you can adjust it here i like having it all the way up um, i wouldn't do that if i had this on of course uh, but if you could find a mix of what you like in there but this is how i prefer it especially when i do uber lapping too Map zoom basically determines how close the map are to your face and how much you can see. I prefer it all the way out to give a better overview of the zone that I'm in. Always highlight. I think that's a great idea. What it does is that you can see it here, for instance. If you don't have it on, then it's only going to show the titles. And um, yeah, I guess this is the title to enter the lion's eyes or something you can interact with. It's also going to influence chests as you run past them so if you have don't have it on it's just going to show you the chest but it's not going to show you the label that you would click to open the chest so it's pretty easy to miss stuff if you don't have that on so i recommend that you have um, always highlight on then there's always show sockets and um, <laughs> i'm a little ambivalent with that because if you don't have it on well, you can actually see what the gear is. You can see the art style of the gear. When you have it on, it's covered in these ugly sockets. But uh, if you have it off right, um, you can always just hover the mouse over it to get in, to see what it is. So it's that's really a personal thing here. I just have it on because it. if I quickly want to see if I have a socket open for something, I don't want to go over all my items. 
showful uh, descriptions. Uh, I guess the best way to indicate that is that if we were to throw down our leather cap here, we can see when we hold the mouse over it, it shows leather cap evasion rating 19. If we have this one off, then it just allows us to click it, but we have no information available. Um, I obviously recommend you have this on, so if there's something on the ground, but you have a full inventory, uh, in order to figure out if it's actually good, worth trading some stuff in your inventory, then you need to know what's on it, right? Life and mana levels basically shows you the amount of life you have and the amount of mana you have available. I think that's a great idea. It's very interesting when you drop very low sometimes to actually know how much health you had left. Show flask buffs. What this does is... I can't really show you right now because we don't have any of the flasks that would buff you, but in Path of Exile there's a lot of flasks that have various utility use that buff your character. And that's something we'll talk much more about too. We only talked about like the recharges of these flasks, but there's lots more to that too. Um, what it does is that if you have show flask buffs, when you click that flask, that buff that then becomes active on your character, it will show up here in the corner. And uh, I don't want that because you tend to get quite a lot of buffs in the game eventually. And uh, having three, four extra flask buffs up there just adds to the clutter. Also because when you do use the flask uh, typically, it will show down here as it being activated. Then uh, very similar to this actually, there is the show aura icons. And uh, if you have an aura, let's say Wrath, which is an aura we'll be using in our setup, that gives increased lightning damage to our spells. If we have show aura icons on and we activate that, it will show up here in the corner. I like that. Um, also because the static, they're staying there all the time and then I can rely on them to see if it's enabled or not. Uh, corpse targeting, this is useful if you are playing a summoner and you want to reanimate a specter, for instance. A specter is, a, well, it's a reanimation of a monster in the game that you have killed um, that you can then take charge over, command over. In order to select the corpse that you want to uh, reanimate with the Spectre ability, you have to hold down uh, A on your keyboard. You can select the corpses and interact with them. Then there is show global chant, and I would very much advise you uh, to turn that off. Global chant is in general just terrible. And uh, it, if you play World of Warcraft, it's like when Baron's chant was really bad, and it's in general just a very toxic environment. I'd recommend turning that off and finding a good guild to be in or finding a chat that's specifically set to a community. So let's say you have a community or some friends, a lot of friends you're playing with. If you don't want to be in party with them, but still want to be able to see uh, and interact with them, then you could, for instance, join, you could do global um, 57. And then you would join Global Chant 57 and there would probably not be other people in there. But if all of your boys uh, do that, then you can use that channel to talk together. It can be pretty uh, useful. And I do have a sub guild in game. So in case you guys would like to join, um, you are most welcome. But you have to be a subscriber on Switch. And it's because it's simply the only way I can control the amount of people coming in. And it kind of filters some of the more toxic people from that. But if so, you just uh, whisper me on Discord and uh, we can make that work. Show mini life bars on allies. This would be uh, your minions. For instance, if you're playing a summoner, if you have this on, it will show health bars and uh, similar to this, like we have. And it uh, you can set this to show on enemies too. I highly recommend having these on. This will give you a much better overview of the fight that you are fighting. I guess we can see it on some of the... Uh, enemies up here because we have that enabled right now we can try and disable it so you can see the difference there we go so you can see these here if they take damage there will be a health indicator above them when they haven't taken any damage it's not showing if we were to take it off you can see it's not there it's i really like that it also feels more engaging somehow then you can have the mini life bar above you in case that you find uh, your monitor is too large for you to look from side to side to see what you have for mana and life um, or to just center the image, right? You can show ally names on your map if you're playing with friends or someone like that. That can be a good uh, idea to know where you have to go if someone calls out, hey, dude, there's something dropped over here. Come and pick it up. Uh, show clock. This will show it down here. Uh, output dialog to chat. 
basically this is when the Templar says something. If he says, oh, I don't like pants, for instance, then it will show up in your um, t uh, chat, basically. So if you sometimes hear them say something, but you're not really sure what they're saying, you can't really filter it, then enable it and you can actually see the voice lines. Then there's advanced mod descriptions and it's... I personally don't like this because I don't feel like it's set up properly, but it can be a good thing to have on. Basically, what it does is that when you ho uh, hold over an item, this one here, for instance, when you then press A, for now, it's just going to show you the item level. Um, but if you have advanced mod descriptions on and you hold it down, it will show you the, that the um, there's the prefix mod on it, barrel, that's a tier 13 prefix mod. And then there is the suffix mod of talent, that's a tier 7. Now, it's very good to know uh, the different prefix and suffix mods that you can roll or what is on a, an item. But I don't personally feel that it's shown very well here in Path of Exile. So instead, I'm using a macro to tell me these things. So what this looks like would be something like this here instead. And we can see down, I'm getting all the info. And then in the bottom, I can see the increased attack speed and the mana. That's a tier 7 suffix, and the other one is a tier 12 prefix. I like that better. I think it's a much easier way of figuring it out. I'm going to link to the macro. I have a video where I go over these things. I'm going to link to that below too. It's, I'd suggest you check that out. We're also going to talk about the macros later in the uh, walkthrough though. But for that reason, I don't use it. If you like it then or don't want to use the macro, then it's a good idea to have on, of course. Auto-equip, this basically means that um, if your inventory is... Uh, closed and you uh, pick up something that you can equip then it will equip it if you uh, have this off it will just be placed into your inventory uh, if you are a racer someone who, who really competes for like super fast uh, play times um, then at the early levels a lot of racers they don't want to have auto equip enabled because if you find an armor piece and you click that it will equip that on your character and when you have an armor equipped it will slow down your movement speed to some extent but besides that, it doesn't matter too much. Mouse wheel zoom, that's pretty basic, right? Confined mouse to window, this is amazing, if you, especially if you have multiple monitors, so you don't accidentally click somewhere else and it minimizes, and it's amazing when you stream and record stuff. Then there's the support gem uh, utility pop-up. This is a new one um, pr uh, that's been added in Betrayal, and I think what it does is simply... Do we have a support gem here? We don't, but it... I'm pretty sure it's the thing that uh, tells you what that support gem can be linked to in like the small window. Uh, and I think that's a good idea to have on. Default loot allocation. There is free fall, short allocation and permanent allocation. What this means is that in, if you're in a party, this is the only place it's going to have any effect. If you're in a party, if it's free for all, then if a monster drops something, then it's basically the first person to pick up that item gets the item. So if um, something drops up here and you're here, but your friend is right here, then he can click it and he can get it faster than you can. Then there's short allocation. What this means is that if the item then drops, again, the same example, if that item has been allocated to you, then you will have a few seconds to pick up that item before anyone else. And the same for your, for your friends, if an item drops that's been allocated to him, he will have a short amount of time to pick that up before someone else. And yeah, it's to prevent people from snatching it, I guess. And then there's permanent allocation. It basically means that if an item is allocated to you and it drops, then no one else can pick up that item unless they leave the zone. I always play with permanent allocation if I'm in a group and it's because it costs less drama. It always, it's pretty annoying when something drops and it's always, um, there's always some people who get super triggered if they don't get the loot. Uh, they feel entitled to it or... And in some cases it can also get a little unfair if it's the same person who gets the same loot five times in a row and no one else gets anything. Uh, permanent allocation basically takes away that discussion about whether about your friend should have the item or you should have the item because the game determines that. And then if it is with permanent allocation and your friend can use the item, then it's up to you, of course, to decide if he, you can, if you want to give it to him. But I feel like this, this cuts some of the drama, which can happen sometimes in these games. Uh, level downscaling, it's not, honestly, it's not really something I've been uh, using, but as, the way it works 
as far as I know, is that if you are playing with another player that's a lower level than you, uh, then your level will get downscaled so you can play properly without the other person having an experience penalty from playing with a character that's much higher level. So this is good if you want to play with a friend who has a much lower level character. Chat font size. Yeah, pretty self-explanatory. Chat box width, you can adjust the size of it by dragging these. And then this thing here, which is very, very important. You want to play with the loot filter in Path of Exile. What is a loot filter? A loot filter is uh, this file you load into the game. Uh, completely supported by GGG. There's nothing wrong with doing it. But it filters out all the shitty loot that you won't use. Um, because there's so many things dropping in Path of Exile that there's no relevancy to the or value to the class that you're playing. And by using a filter plate, uh, or well, if by using a loot filter, then you can filter that stuff out so you can just focus on the stuff that may have potential value or usefulness to your character. And uh, for this particular walkthrough, I made a loot filter based on NeverSync's Filter Blade website. Um, and I'm sharing that with you guys in case you just want a very, very basic loot filter that uh, is very forgiving, that shows most stuff but hides the absolute trash. Normally, I play with a very strict loot filter, but for this, if you're completely new, this would be a good idea to just use this to get a good idea of how it works. So if you go to filterblade.xyc, then you can uh, in here, uh, design the loot filter. This is the loot filter I've designed for this particular thing, but you can create your own here. In another episode, I'll show you how we do this. And to give an example of how this works or looks when you have the loot filter enabled, we can click simulate up here. Basically, this creates a, an artificial situation of you being in game. So all the things you see here, the ones that are grayed out, they would not show up when you have your loot filter enabled. It's we can do this here and you can see this is what would be showing up when the loot filter is then enabled. And all of this here would be filtered out. You can also select the zone and such and we can try and generate a bit more loot. These are the things that would show up and all of this wouldn't. So it basically saves you a ton of time um, and uh, patience because you don't have to, you, you don't find yourself picking up all the crap, going back to the uh, town and vendoring it for, you know, it's just a waste of time. It's better to kill fast and skip all the stuff that really doesn't have any value and just pick up the stuff that holds uh, value. And um, but as I said, it like start with a very basic semi strict filter at max and then you can make it the more strict uh, as you go for it. But I'm going to share uh, the loot filter that I've made for it this year in case you want to use it it's very forgiving and very uh, light on it and then you can always make it more strict later uh, in order to get the loot filter then you have to go to your you have to go to downloads and then let's say you just say uh, survival filter um, lmb semi strict then uh, you can download the file and uh, then we'll go to my games folder. You can also do this in game in Path of Exile when you're in the UI setting and you can press show folder uh, down by the loot filter and it will open this folder here, the Path of Exile folder under my games. Uh, then you will take the file that we just downloaded and we will move that into the Path of Exile my games folder. Once we've done that, we can go into Path of Exile and then if we go to the UI section again, Go down to the list of it or item filters. We can select the tier survival filter LMB semi strict. And then you press reload. And then it's activated. Remember to save. And then there you go. When you kill thousands of monsters uh, in Path of Exile, there is an insane amount of items dropping. This here is probably a better way to indicate it. So we killed these uh, three boys here. If I hold down Alt right now, you can see items showing up all over the place. And it, as I said, it can get much worse, right? If I don't hold it down, it's being filtered. And these fil items that have been filtered here, they are of no use to me. They have no value. Um, so why should I bother picking them up? It's just going to slow me down. So I um, really recommend a loot filter. In uh, the first episode of the walkthrough of the survival guide, we talked about uh, the leaks what you need to be aware of then when you select the leak we talked about 
what you need to be aware of when you create a class. We talked about how support gems and active skill gems uh, interact. And we talked about um, the UI settings. And all of these things can be explained in so much more detail. And as we go through and continue on towards the series, I will take these things up again when it makes more sense. But I, there's a little too much information for me to cover uh, at the very beginning for me to go in details about it. But I promise you guys, you'll get a very good explanation if you just keep watching the survival guide. And episode two will be out uh, a day from now. I hope you guys enjoyed this. If you are on Twitch, come visit me on uh, Twitch TV slash lifting. If you want to take the support to the next level, you can grant me a Twitch Prime sub. You can click a become member below the uh, YouTube video. There's also my Patreon if you want to check that out. Remember to subscribe for more videos. Thank you for watching, bros. And uh, well, do you even do it?